And really, you should invest in your passion. Like your passion's going to beat you up. It's going to tear you apart. You're, it's going to show you just how ugly, you know, it feels to not do something well. But then you pick yourself up. I am unwilling to give up. That I will start over from scratch as many times as it takes to get where I want to be. I want to be. You just want to make sure you will get knocked down, but just make sure you don't get knocked out knocked out so your only choice should be go focus on what you can control 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 hi everyone and welcome to the Kara golden show join me each week for inspiring conversations with some of the world's greatest leaders we'll talk with founders entrepreneurs ceos and really some of the most interesting people of our time can't wait to get started let's go let's go Hi, everyone. It's Kara from the Kara Golden Show, and I'm super excited to have my next guest here, my friend, Laura Gassner Odding. Welcome, welcome. Hello, Kara, and congratulations on your awesome book launch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Laura actually had me on a uh, LinkedIn Live, and I think it actually was streamed on FaceTime, right, as well? Yeah, and, it was yeah, on Facebook, we, YouTube, LinkedIn, was on Twitch. We put it everywhere. It yeah, was awesome. you put it everywhere. It was awesome. It was a lot of fun. And as we were chatting, it was kind of really about sort of my book that launched three weeks ago. But I said, wait, what about your book? I want to get I want to get you on here to really share with the audience. And yes. Don't they look good together? <laughs> right? They're like, they're friends, right? And so anyway, I just, I was really excited to get Laura to come on and really chat about her book, Limitless, How to Ignore Everybody, Carve Your Own Path and Live Your Best Life. I mean, how could you disagree with any of that portion at all? And it's it's so good. And the book actually launched a little over a year ago, but is really just timeless, I think, on so many levels. So I was just talking to Laura about how I reread the book this weekend. And it was just there were so many great insights and inspiration in it that I'm really excited to have you here today. So thank you. Yeah. So and just a little bit more about in addition to being an author and just an awesome, awesome person, she actually was a presidential appointee in the Clinton administration and helped shape this like tiny little thing called AmeriCorps. I mean, just didn't do anything. I mean, and so anyway, I remember when I met you and you were telling me, I was like, wait, what? Wait, let's <laughs> let's like go back to that. I mean, that was just such a huge, huge accomplishment for you to be involved in. So congratulations and thank you for really working on that and developing that idea. So go back to like, who was Laura? Like, how did you get there? How did you end up, you know, being so awesome on so many levels? And did you always like want to work in government? Did you always think I'm going to go and start this AmeriCorps dream and really help so many people? Like, how did this all start? So I remember when I was interviewing you and I read this in your book, the story of how you went to go work for John McCain Mm -hmm. when you were young and you were like, I want to work for you because I want to figure out if I'm a Republican or not. And I remember just resonating so much with that story because, you know, I grew up, you know, I'm going to be 50. I grew up in the sort of the Reagan era. Like he Mm -hmm. was, you know, like the great communicator. And, and I remember feeling like safe, right? Like he just, he was straight out of central casting. And I thought, okay, well, it seems like rich people are Republicans and poor people are Democrats and I want to be rich. So I should be a Republican. And I just assumed that I was. So I remember when I was 17 years old, because I, you know, like I never frontal lobe, like that was a pretty incorrect and unsophisticated thinking about like the two political parties. And I remember walking around my senior class where everyone else was turning 18 and I had just turned 17 because I skipped kindergarten. Like I knew how to stack blocks, I guess, when I was six <laughs> years old. And and I remember imploring my classmates to register as Republicans, right? I remember like giving them all the arguments about why it was so important. And then you fast forward a few years and I go to college and suddenly I'm out of my bubble and I'm looking around and I'm like, wait a minute, 
I'm not a Republican. <laughs> I think I'm a Democrat. And I was always very involved. I was always really interested in sort of civic matters. And I thought I was going to be the first female Democratic senator from the great state of Florida. I was going to graduate from college. I was going to go to law school. I was going to graduate at the top of my class, law review, all of that. And then I was going to make a name for myself in the district attorney's office and I'd be recruited and I would win and I'd go to the Senate. And then I got as far as law school. And I looked around the very first day and I was like, I I don't belong here. I don't want to do this. This isn't what I want. And I just made this terrible mistake. And so I did the thing that everybody does when they make a terrible mistake is you start dating somebody who is awful for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I start dating this boy. Why not, right? Why not, right? So I start <laughs> dating this boy and I'd ridden my bike to school that day and it was raining. And he's like, well, I'll give you a ride home from campus. Let me just put your bike in the back of my I rock Z, which will tell you basically everything you need to know about this guy. Oh my God, the I rock Z. Yeah, that is frightening. I remember that car. The I rock Z, and he blasts, you know, like Def Leppard or whatever it is that we're listening to. And he's like, But before I drop you off at home, I want to stop at this guy's campaign office. He's running for president. Because, you know, this is back before the internet. So, like, you had to go to like a strip mall and pick a paper that actually listed people's, you know, stances. And I was like, Governor who? From where? Arkansas, not a chance in hell. Like George H.W. Bush had just won Desert Storm. He had a 91% approval rating. And I was like, not a chance. And then we walk into this office and there on this tiny little TV in the corner is then Governor Bill Clinton on, you know, this black and white TV. He's got brown hair still. And he's talking about, he's in like this impassioned plea about how there's, there's nothing that's wrong with America that can't be fixed with what's right with America. And he offers as a policy solution service, community service, service in exchange for college tuition. And I was like, oh, yes. Like a light bulb went off, right? A light bulb went off. And I suddenly I went from the like, I can fix all the problems. What can I do to help? How can I be the center to that needs to happen? And how do we get the right people in the right place to make that happen? And so I swiftly dropped out of law school, sort of volunteering on the campaign. He won and ended up in the White House. I ended up in the White House. And there I was in the office that helped create AmeriCorps. That's just wild. So it's a crazy story. Yeah, such a crazy story. And then ultimately, so you ended up working then not just creating it, but you were like working on the actual. So tell me about that, like how exciting that was. You know, it was so exciting. And it was look, I was 22 years old when I walked into the White House. And I, you know, I walked into the White House literally wearing my mother's hand me down clothes. Like I had like the Alexis Carrington shoulder pads in there. And I (laughs) I have on my walls pictures of me with Bill Clinton in the Oval Office. And I'm like, I can't believe that I was wearing that. Like, that's the picture. That's the picture that I'm stuck with. So, you know, the 80s weren't kind to anybody fashion wise. But if, you know, you're young and dumb and don't have any money in the bank, you wear 80s fashions in 1993 in the Oval Office. So there I was. And we were, it was exciting because we were so idealistic and so naive that we didn't think failure was an option. Like this was, it was such a gimme. It was such a, a bipartisan thing, right? I mean, John McCain supported it. It was, it was such a bipartisan thing, this idea of serving your country making your country a better place and changing yourself in the process, making yourself better in the process. It was as American as American gets. And yet we had, there was opposition. And so my boss, a man by the name of Eli Siegel, who had run the 92 campaign, he basically had a a strategic campaign where he went to every senator, every congressman, every governor, and he traveled around the country to convince them that this was something that should be done and how it would benefit their state and their communities. And it was my job, in addition to getting coffee, to plan his travel. So this is pre-internet. I had a, a giant map of the United States on the wall, and I would put like little pins in places that he was planning a trip to. They were green pins and places that he was already planned were yellow and the ones he'd been to were red. And I, I used to have to try to figure this out before the internet. I'd have to figure out travel, government funded travel for the internet. And I think when you do that, when you're 22 years old, you come to the conclusion that there's no problem you can't solve. Yeah, no, it's just, it's true. I love the idea that there was like no roadmap for this. I mean, that's like, you know, you were just trying and you were just figuring out, which is really the essence of my book and what I, you know, truly believe that so many great things have just come out of 
people just going and trying something. I mean, you didn't know whether or not this was going to work. I mean, it sounded like a great idea. You were excited by it. Yes. You thought like the idea of just going and ultimately working on it was, you know, pretty darn cool, especially for a 22 year old. But that's just awesome. And now you can like look back in the rear view mirror and say, like, I actually did something pretty great. We actually did that. The 25th anniversary was when uh, Obama was uh, still in office. Maybe it was the 20th when Obama was still in office. And so the swearing in ceremony in the, on the South Lawn didn't actually happen because somebody who had, you know, mental health issues decided to commit suicide that day by flying a Cessna into the jumbotron that we had back on the back South Lawn of the White House. We were going to have Bill Clinton swear in a thousand AmeriCorps members on the South Lawn and then simulcast it to jumbotrons in major cities all over the country. And we were going to swear in like 10,000 AmeriCorps members or 20,000 AmeriCorps members all at the same time. And I get a phone call at like three in the morning from Secret Service like, uh, hello, Miss Gassner, please turn on. Or this is Agent so-and-so from blah, blah, blah. We have a situation. I was like, ah, shut up. I thought it was my brother-in-law. And I like hung up the phone. Phone rings again. Miss Gassner, this is Agent so-and-so from the Secret Service. Ah, shut up. I hang up the phone. Miss Gassner, this is Agent Smith from the Secret Service. Please turn on CNN. <laughs> I turn on oh, CNN and it was my like, gosh. so- all thousand America members, we bring them to the North Lawn. We have to figure out how to get like McDonald's to like feed them because they're we're there for hours and hours and nobody knows what's happening. But don't you think like in building hint, don't you think that like the times where you figured out what you were made of and the times that you learned what you could were capable of or when you were like nine toes over the edge of your incompetence, you're like, I know that there's something here, but I just I don't quite know how we're going to do it, but if we keep moving ahead, we're going to figure it out. Like we're going to build this yeah. plane as we're sailing it or as we're flying it because that's the only option. Yeah. I mean, you're what you're bringing up too. I mean, there's a few different things that come to mind. One thing that I was just talking about this morning is that people would always say to me, like, don't look back. Right. And I'm always thinking, actually, like I gain a lot of energy and confidence from looking back. Right. Yes. And so it's just, it just depends. Right. And also, people would say to me, you know, like, you're going to go and do a beverage company. Like, what happens if it fails? Like, the stuff that I had accomplished in the past, I could always like go back to. Right. I could go right. back to tech. I could go back and do these things. So, when you think about like one of my favorite sayings that I talk about in the book, too, is, you know, always ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, yes. along with that, it's really think about like, you know, what is it that I could ultimately go back to? I mean, if if you've accomplished something, you've built AmeriCorps, like what else could you do? And how many things yes. along the way in building AmeriCorps worked, didn't work? Like, it's all like lessons that ultimately lead you to do lots of great things, including writing this book. So let's talk about, so after that experience, I mean, obviously it's 25 years old. Like what, what did you go on to do from there? Uh, well, you know, so I walked into Eli's office after four years and I was like, all right, I'm ready to get back on the campaign trail again. Like, let's go. It's, you know, 96 election. And he said to me in the way that only like a mentor can say to you, he was like, well, Laura, you're kind of too old to get back on a campaign bus and eat cold pizza and sleep in high school gymnasium floors. And you're kind of too young to be the domestic oh policy God. advisor. So go talk to my friend, Arnie Miller. He runs the biggest search firm in the country that does specifically nonprofit work. And he'll find you a job, you'll hide out for four years, and you'll come back and do something on Al Gore's campaign. And I was like, great, sounds good. And I sat down with with Arnie, Arnie Miller, to whom I dedicate. I actually dedicated my first book to Eli, and this book is dedicated to Arnie. And I said, this is great. Come find me a job. You know, find me a job. And he was like, terrific. So uh, let's talk about what you can do. And then I was like, wait a minute you're in Boston, your work's in Boston, and I'm dating a guy who's not driving an IROC Z, um, who is about to move to Boston. I should come work for you. And he's like, you should come work for me. And the next thing you know, I become a headhunter. So it was completely not strategic. But I can now look back and I can say, okay, I dropped out of law school because I wanted to put Bill Clinton in office because he had an idea that I thought was good. Then I became a headhunter, which meant that I was still putting the right people in the right place to make the world a better place in the way that I defined it. And now I, you know, work as a as a writer and as a speaker where I'm empowering people to do better things. So it's like it. there's actually a theme that sort of goes through my life of like what really excites me is figuring out what people are made of and what they can accomplish and why they do what they do and how to allow them to be unfettered in this. In fact, the 
limitless is baked around this concept of consonance, right? This idea of when what you Mm -hmm. do matches who you are. And it was originally going to be called consonance, doing work that matters until a friend of mine was like, Lord, three people are going to buy that book. And one of them will be you and two of them will be your parents. And I can't guarantee that those two are going to buy it. Because it's not a very common word. It's not a common word. Yeah. And he was like, what do you want? And I'm like, you know, I just, I'm so sick of people just being limited by everybody else's idea of what they can do and who they can be and what their life holds. And I just wish they'd stop listening to all those people and just live their own damn life already and be happy. And he was like, so you want them to be limitless? Ignore everybody, carve their own path and live your best life. And I was like, yes. <laughs> yes. And that's the thing. I mean, I think my book Undaunted and Limitless have a lot of yes. synergies. They are not the same, but they have a lot of synergies. That, and that's really what I, I loved about it as well. So what do you think are kind of the key besides the consonants and besides going out and trying? I mean, what do you believe are are like the key issues that people kind of need to get out of their own yeah, way, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, that's really what I realized in reading your book too, that, you know, a belief that I've had is that oftentimes, like, if you believe that you can't do something, you can't, You're right? right? right. And, right. and yet, and through your story, through my story, through so many people's stories that I've, you know, been able to read about or meet these people, I feel like you really can go out and be limitless. So, but what do you think are like the key things that you want people to take away from the book? Yeah. So after AmeriCorps and going to work for someone else as a headhunter, I had this moment of rage where I realized that there was a better, different way to do the work. And I started my own recruiting firm, which is its own limitless story in and of itself that I tell in the book. But it means that I spent 20 years in executive recruiting and 20 years recruiting people who were super successful in the work that they were doing. Like mm-hmm. As a recruiter, I was being paid by my clients to go out and find the most successful people and recruit them into their organization. So that was my job, to call thousands of people who were super successful, on paper, amazing jobs. But the truth is it wasn't that hard because even though on paper they had this success, I found that they really weren't all that happy. So I was being paid to call them because they were successful, but they were taking my calls because they weren't that happy. And I got to see firsthand the disconnect that comes from people whose actions don't actually get them closer to the things that they want in the world. So we're all super busy. Um, Our calendars are full of stuff. Our email boxes are full of stuff. Our to-do lists are full of stuff that are being dictated by others, which means that it's not being dictated by us. And it happens, you know, for me, I had a teacher who was like, Laura, you're pretty argumentative. You should become a lawyer. And I was like, yeah, you're wrong. (laughs) Because of course I was argumentative. That's why I started that path to go to law school. I had a grandmother who was really upset that I broke up with the nice Jewish doctor, right? I mean, I I had a boss who told me that I needed to, you know, do the work as fast and as, as efficiently as possible so that we could make as much profit, but it wasn't working for me in terms of helping my clients achieve their missions, which is why I started my own firm. And I think what happens is along the way, we're told, like, pick a path, pick a major, pick a college, pick a trade. And often it's when we're like 16, 17, 18 years old. So we don't actually have like the capacity. We don't have a frontal lobe. We don't have the capacity to make mm-hmm. good decisions. And so we're asked to make these decisions about the rest of our lives when we don't have the capacity to make good ones. And so we get stuck running someone else's race. We get stuck living someone else's life. And look, you're an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. You know, you can't be insatiably hungry for someone else's goals. So we're in this place and we're like, I'm working really hard. It's not making me all that happy. Why is it? And it's because we're giving votes in our lives to people who shouldn't have voices. We're letting other people dictate what's a good job, what's a good marriage, what's a good house, what's a good weight, what's a good anything. So true. And, you know, like, yeah, we give up. We're like, oh, well, maybe the Kardashians will tell me what I should be doing. It's nonsense. So we get stuck because we're seeding our own definition of success to somebody else along the way. So true. Have you spoken a lot on college campuses? I feel like you could really tell that story so well. I would love to. When when the book first came out, I was like, I sort of set this like moonshot goal of I want this book to be required reading for every incoming college freshman because I wish I'd had it when I was an incoming college freshman. So I was starting to make some inroads into that and then coronavirus hit. So, you know, That'll be a 2021 goal. I definitely, I've done a ton of speaking on college campuses, but I feel like there's a lot of, you know, great messages and it's really fun. Actually, it's a different energy that comes from this group because I think a lot of what, 
you're sharing are maybe ideas, especially that college students might have, but it's counter to sort of what they're being told or asked every single day. Like, what do you want to do? Right. And I think it's important. And especially during this time when, I mean, I, I have three college students and, you know, there's, I'm like, look, we take it week by week. Like if next semester it's all online and you're choosing not to do that, then actually have plan B, you know, to kind of figure out, like, I don't think there's, I mean, who says that you have to graduate in four years, right? Like, I mean, I don't know. Like if you actually could figure out if you want to go and like my son loves, my 18 year old loves cars and he had met some different people that are really involved with Tesla and some other like car companies. I'm like, I don't know. Sounds really cool. Like it actually could really impact kind of how you think about what you ultimately want to do when you, you know, grow up and, and what you're passionate about. Maybe you'll go and do that. Those, I mean, to the AmeriCorps concept, like maybe you go and figure out like what you think you want to go in that way, but you learn just by going and testing that a little bit. Like, I just think that's such an important thing. You know, I think that we, I think that we're taught at some point, like you get, you show some promise in something. So somebody's like, do more of that. Like you're good at math. You're a math person. You're good at history. You're a words person, right? Like we get labeled really early on and we get labeled in our jobs also. And I think then we're Mm -hmm. like, we're afraid to like, if you step left, if you step right, you might fail. And Mm -hmm. it's very funny. There's a part of my book, which I know you resonated with, which is that failure is not finale. It's fulcrum, right? Like it's the place where you learn Mm -hmm. and you grow and you iterate and you change. And I was actually giving this talk at uh, a Renaissance weekend once. And it was the very first talk I gave for for Limitless. And there were, I don't know, like 200 people in the room. And I remember giving my whole spiel about failure is not finale, it's fulcrum. And then I looked to stage left and there was Commander Tim Copra of NASA. And Commander Tim Copra's gone on three spacewalks. And I remember I was like, failure's not finale, it's fulcrum. Except for you, sir. <laughs> like for everyone yeah, else. Exactly. Like, failure for you is most definitely finale. But for the rest of us, you know, plan B. Like I ask, I tell people all the time in entrepreneurship conferences, they're like, well, what if I fail? And I'm like, oh, okay, what if you fail? And there's always an answer. It's like, well, I'll go back to this job. I'll start doing this. I'll do this other thing. They always know their plan B. So I'm like, fine. You know your plan B. Now go put it on the side and go go focus on plan A. So like, yeah, if our kids are graduating from college and there's not a billion jobs that are necessarily out there right now, it's a gift. It's a great opportunity to go figure out what you love to do. And then, you know, I have noticed in 20 years of search that when people find what they love to do, they often figure out a way to get paid for it because it ends up like there's all this nonsense, like follow your passion. And I think like that's such bad advice. Like you should want to work in your passion. Yes. But follow your passion comes with this idea that if you follow your passion, everything's going to be just fine. Mm -hmm. And really, you should invest in your passion. Like your passion's going to beat you up. It's going to tear you apart. It's going to show you just how ugly, you know, it feels to not do something well. But then you pick yourself up and you learn and you go like you didn't just follow your passion when you started this company. You invested in it. You worked in it. You figured it out. So you can work in your passion now because you invested in it early. And I think, you know, it's a great opportunity now for people to try the thing that they we're afraid of trying before because, you know, there's so much unknown right now that there's just no way to necessarily plan. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I think there are so many people today. I was on a CNBC segment actually a few weeks ago, and the person interviewing me mentioned that the number of women dropping out of the workforce is 30% higher than it's ever been since yes. women started working. Yes, And so she's like, what would you say to those women? And I said, look, like it's tough, right? Like it's homeschooling kids. And I, I mean, I have four and they're older now. I didn't have to do that. I get it. I think it's challenging, especially when you're trying to work and, and Mm -hmm. have to figure out like, is my kid actually like on the zoom call with the teacher? And like, I can only imagine, I mean, it's, and we definitely have employees that are going through that as well. But Do I believe that this is a time where you can kind of sit back and, and kind of think about, and again, like I, sometimes I call it passion, but I think what it really is, is what are you curious about, Mm -hmm. right? Like, what is that thing that you wish, like that product that you wish was out there or a service that you wish was out there that ultimately, and even if you don't do anything about it, like 
ultimately, how about figuring out, can I write a business plan around it? Can Mm -hmm. I, you know, the number of times I've heard from people saying, I don't know how to write a business plan. And I'm like, like, well, why don't you go figure it out? Right? Like there's (laughs) so many tools today that allow you to go do it. And if nothing else, like imagine in six months from now, when people said, well, what did you do during your time off? And that you said, well, I actually figured out how to write a business plan, like whatever it is, being able to say that you accomplished anything like is pretty great. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's like I think people they're entrepreneurs, right? Like they they, mm-hmm. they want to do it. And when push comes to shove, it's like there's always an excuse. There's always a reason why. And, you know, I break it down in the book and I talk a lot about side quests. Yeah. You know, these, this, this idea of like- side quests, yeah. <laughs> right, because you had teenage boys. So, you yeah. know, like, the, the, so the side quest for, for those who don't know is if you're playing video games and if the goal of the video game is like, go to the castle, slay the dragon, save the princess, like, but you're playing with a friend and he's still doing dishes so he hasn't logged on yet. What can you do? You're a farmer so you can go to you could till your wheat you could take it to the market you could sell it with that money you can buy the sword you can buy the potions you could buy the horse so that when your friend does log on and you're ready you can go to the castle and slay the dragon and save the princess and so i say to people all the time like fine you want to do this thing but you can't do it right now because you're homeschooling your kids okay learn how to write a business plan it's too hard to figure out how to write a business plan just watch a couple of ted talks about people about how they started their companies if that seems too much just listen to a podcast um, of somebody who interviews entrepreneurs there're always moments there're always side quests that we can have where we can advance a little bit like you don't have to get all the way there and i think a lot of times the getting all the way there maybe is scary like what if i get there and it I don't like it, but that's what these side quests are all about. So that when your kids are back in school, then you do have the business plan. You do have the knowledge. You've listened to 20 podcasts or 200 podcasts about the mistakes people made along the way. So you're not doing things like I did, which is like saving money, being cheap and actually spending too much money because you're doing your invoices when you should be going out and finding new customers, right? right? Like right. all of those lessons that you learn along the way, which are like, duh. So I think like COVID is a perfect time to be doing those side quests, to be figuring that out. And I also think that that's also the moment when you're like, actually, maybe I don't want to do this. And I think that's okay too. Like, I think it's fine to say, I don't want it that badly. It turns out I don't want to run a marathon, so I'm not going to go run a mile today. That's fine. Like, you don't have to want all the things everyone else wants. It's a great time to figure out what you want. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And I think it's it's something else that, it's another episode, but it's something else that we've... uh, really instilled in our company to, to always be learning and always be testing. And so like, I think that in order to actually grow and be limitless as well, that you always have to be kind of figuring out what else is out there that you're curious about that you want to go do. And I mean, you can do it through a side hustle, but in addition to that, I think like we have a person inside of our company who grew up in finance and always thought that they were supposed to be finance and then was kind of like, you know, keeping his ear to the ground on operations. And then he realized how operations actually had so many finance components and was just curious about it and then really realized how much he loved it. And today, I mean, he's not only a great manager and really has a great understanding of finance, but he's really my my husband, who is our chief operating officer's right hand on all things operations. He didn't know that he was going to be you know, this operations executive, he didn't know he'd even like it. Like he, you know, he had no idea what supply chain was, but he had an opportunity to go try and go Mm. learn and always be learning. And so now today he's always like, okay, I get that. I want to keep going. I want to keep going. Like he views every single day as what else can I learn? Which I think is like, that's what gets you up in the morning. That's what keeps you, you know, really ignoring everybody else. Like it really is the Mecca. It really is what drives you ultimately. So I think if you can find that, then that also is really, really helpful. Yeah. Because like, if you look, if you listen to interviews of any leader anywhere, what's the theme that you hear every single time is that they spend 30 to 45 minutes every single day reading, right? Mm -hmm. They're reading, they're learning, they're constantly teaching themselves. Because I think as leaders, you get to this place where you're expected to know all the answers, which means that you're speaking 
all the time. And like, the more you talk, the less you listen. Totally. And so it becomes this place where you're not growing, you're not evolving, you're not changing, you're not iterating. And then the market passes you by, people pass you by, politics passes you by, whatever it is, whatever you're, whatever you're in, you become less relevant. So, you know, I was one of the things that one of the first things you said to me, and I was like, ah, oh, she's one of my people, right? When yeah. you were like, I try to read every day. And you were talking about how during the book launch, that's been hard for you to do. And that's been something that you've really missed. And I was like, yes, yes, yeah. I like her. <laughs> well, and you know, I think it's, I mean, to that point about reading, I often run into people who say like, how do I find a mentor? Right. That is actually, they've built this wall up to think, okay, there's this like, you know, there's a prize out there, right? right? Like they've got to have a list of people. Most of my mentors are actually make believe, right? Like in some ways, Here's right? A mentor. Yeah, right. exactly. I just read constantly. And then, you know, every once in a while, I'll run into these people. I mean, one super fast example, and this isn't by reading, but this is, well, I guess this was by reading way back when, but I remember when I was at CNN years ago, and uh, I don't think I've shared the story with you, but everybody was really focused on Ted Turner. And I, you know, he's great. And uh, he had built this thing and amazing. Yeah. But this is at a time when CNN and some other networks were starting. And I had heard about this woman, Kay Koplovitz, who was starting USA Network. And I was kind of like, that's actually harder. Like, and mm. people would be like, why do you think it's harder? And I'm like, yes, you're competing against primetime television. You're not really focused for the consumer. Like there were a lot of things going through my head, but I just all, I loved the idea that she was just like a go-getter and that mm -hmm. she just was like, you know, going to go and just go and make it happen. And every day, like she kept making more and more progress anyway. So she was always this person that was kind of a mentor to me. I'd never met her for like 20 years. And then I was at an EY conference and was one of their entrepreneurs. And she was like in the crowd. And all I could think of was Kay Koplovitz, USA Network. And I said, I totally remember you because you were like, you know, my God over here, like you, I would watch you, I would read about you. And I just so admired you as a female leader. And she just looked at me and she was like, oh, my gosh, like she was like, that was like, she must have been gobsmacked. <laughs> yeah. And again, like she was just like, I can't believe, you know, what did you do? I said, well, I was at CNN and, you know, and then I worked for Ted and it was like, I mean, it was amazing, but on a lot of levels, like I kept looking at you yeah. and she's like, why didn't you come over to USA Network? And I was like, well, you know, I moved out to Silicon Valley, whatever. Anyway, net net of it is that we became friends after that. And then she partnered with these two other women to form this fund called Springboard. And during the pandemic, they actually, she was phoning me and saying, how are you guys doing? Is everything okay? Like she had invested about a year and a half ago. And I said, yeah, it's great. But I mean, our business is going through a hockey stick right now. And I want to have enough money in the bank for the next couple of years, you know, because yeah. nobody really knows sort of what this picture looks like. And she's like, I think that's really smart. I think that's really great. And so she helped me raise $25 million. Amazing. And like, and again, from looking at somebody who really like gets it and ultimately, like, I didn't know when I was going to meet her. Like, I called her my mentor. I'm like, you're like my secret mentor. And, you know, like, I've read all about you. She, it wasn't even a book. It was like the, through the newspapers at the time. It wasn't. But so, again, this energy, this mentorship, the way of thinking can come from books. It can come from just reading about people and admiring them. And maybe you'll meet them one day. Yeah. And you'll get to say what I said yes. to Kay. And, and ultimately, there's that relationship then. So Absolutely. I'm a huge believer in that. And can I, I do want to say one other thing about mentoring. Yeah. I think that there are, I mean, that's such an amazing story. And I think that the, the mentorship, the pretend, <laughs> the imaginary mentorship yeah. relationship that you have with her didn't start as a mentorship relationship. It started because you read something that was a mentoring moment for you. And I think even in person, we say like, how do I get a mentor? And a mentor is a hard, like you're busy. I'm busy. I would love to mentor lots of people, but that's a lot of work. I would yeah. much rather give mentoring moments. I'll have coffee with you. I'll do a Zoom call with you. We'll, you know, have lunch. I'll give you some mentoring. 
and then I'm going to move on. And then it's up to you. If you come back, if you tell me what you've done, if you like keep, you know, sending me interesting articles, like if you feed the relationship, those mentoring moments might become a mentor relationship. But I think we put so much heft in like, I have to find a mentor when really read a book, get some mentoring, read that article, get some mentoring. And I think if we just like, there is so much learning that can be done, but it can be done. Yeah. Right. Like, how do I find, how do I write a business plan? Google it. <laughs> it's yeah. just like Google it. Well, and then the other point today that is, you know, really valuable in addition to your amazing book, Limitless, is that so many great leaders are actually going on LinkedIn Live or on Facebook Live or and or they're writing or whatever it is and trying to really get their messages out too. So you might actually be able to really you know, meet people who might be time constrained, you know, like you and along the way that just join you yes. and, and want to follow you. So I think yes. that, that the options are actually limitless. Oh, I, I see you what you go. did there. It's really interesting. Last night, I did a podcast last night for somebody that I don't know. It's not a huge podcast. It, it would not have risen to the level of like, it was an 8 p.m. podcast. So it's like, does it rise to the level of taking time away from my family to do this, right? How, how big is the audience? But the reason yeah. I said yes was because I've been going on LinkedIn Live. We did our, our our thing on LinkedIn Live. And this guy has been on almost every one of them. And not only has he been on them, he comments on them. He's engaged in them. He shares them out. And I, when he asked me to be on his show, I was like, you know what? Yeah, because you've been yeah. awesome. There's never been such easy access to the people who you want to have in your circle. Like it's just, I love just do it. It is, it is so little de democratized right now. You can have conversations with anybody online. So, you know, it's like, figure out what you want, figure out who you admire, figure out who you want to be like, and then just start forming relationships. Like we're all human beings. I totally agree. So this yeah. is awesome. So everybody go by Limitless, go by Undaunted to just get a double header, right? So you can go on to Amazon. I mean, if you buy both of these books, exactly, you, there's exactly. nothing you can't do for sure. Laura, thank you so much. Laura Gassner Odding. And uh, where can people find you on social? So my name is Laura Gassner Odding. So lauragassnerodding.com, but it's a lot of names. So all my good friends call me LGO. So you can find me at hey LGO, heylgo.com and on all the socials on that, hey LGO. I love it. Very, very cool. And everybody give great reviews on this. This was an awesome session. Thank you so much for coming on, Laura, for sure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody have a great rest of the week. Before we sign off, I want to talk to you about fear. People like to talk about fearless leaders, but achieving big goals isn't about fearlessness. Successful leaders recognize their fears and decide to deal with them head on in order to move forward. This is where my new book, Undaunted, comes in. This book is designed for anyone who wants to succeed in the face of fear, overcome doubts, and live a little undaunted. Order your copy today at undauntedthebook.com and learn how to look your doubts and doubters in the eye and achieve your dreams. For a limited time, you'll also receive a free case of Hint Water. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to Spotlight? Send me a tweet at Kara Golden and let me know. And if you like what you heard, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Kara Golden. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.